Do, 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 do. Hey, hey, the drug class. Woo. All right, guys. So I don't know if you can see me or not. I guess we'll find out later if I got Tiny Rick shirt on. Tiny Rick. So here's the deal. We're going to do the alcohol lecture now. As I've mentioned, I really miss you, and this is no way to get an education. We're really going to just focus on alcohol itself, the drug, its acute effects, its chronic effects, and things like that. And then we'll do an alcoholism lecture later. Just really want to elaborate on some of the problem uses of alcohol. It's still a dangerous drug, really toxic. It's no canvas. So what are we going to do here? We're basically going to walk through some of the history of alcohol and alcohol use. As you guess, it goes way back. Uh, fermentation, when we talked about heck and boozo and things like that, it's clearly basically been around as long as humans have had grains in water sitting around. We didn't even understand the role of yeast for the first few millennia, but uh, obviously yeast respire anaerobically. That gives off um, CO2 and alcohol. Any sugar that a yeast can eat is definitely going to turn into an alcoholic beverage. So you can make alcoholic beverages from any grain. It was a great way to store things. Uh, George Washington had a still and made money from it. Like this is this is part of our history, definitely, and part of humanity's. I mean, U.S. history, but part of humanity's history, going all the way back to the Tigris and Euphrates days. The different types of beverages. So I'm often surprised how you guys don't necessarily. Uh, get immersed in this. I do tend to elaborate a little long on these and I apologize if I get too lost in like how to make moonshine. I will move along. And then finally just definitions on standard drinks and binges which has uh, generated a lot of interest and in some controversial research including some from some of my students. And then the chance to get into acute effects and chronic effects. Are there any health effects? Things like that. <clears throat> So I had a just sample item, Prohibition took effect in 1920. In the U.S., the history with alcohol is, is conflicted at best. So we've had prohibitionists since at least the early 1800s, folks who could have sworn that if we could just get alcohol out of everyone's hands, the world would be a better place. They did get a law passed, and it was went into effect in 1920. So if you can keep that in mind for the exam, that's great. But if you think about timing with World War One, with uh, prohibitions repeal and problems with the stock market, and then just see if it seems to gender any parallels to common days and the chances for cannabis prohibition to be repealed. Let's, let's keep that kind of stuff in mind. But bottom line, prohibition took effect in 1920. The Volstead Act uh, passed earlier than that, and that provided essentially the budget for enforcement for prohibition. Uh, bad liquor filled with impurities. This is just a shout out to my grandma. So monkey rum was what she used to call that. But truth be told, rum is made from molasses. And if you only filter it one time, of course, it's, it's going to have impurities in it. If you only distill it one time, although that was my grandma's strategy when she was making bathtub gin. So... Uh, prohibition was the last time my family had any money, and those were the days. What can I say? You will not have an item like this on the exam. I don't feel like alcohol slang is worth getting into. So I want to get into three types of alcoholic uh, beverage categories. The bottom line just being that these really are distinguished by how they're made, but also by how much alcohol is in there, and it does raise the question of proof versus... Uh, alcohol by volume percentage. So beer is brewed, right? The amber nectar, it's essentially uh, hops and barley. If, uh, if you just take a grain and put a lot of yeast in there and kind of wait, you will get a beer-like concoction. And in fact, Buzo, it looks like some of those ancient Egyptian recipes. I couldn't tell if they were trying to brew beer or bake bread and just messed up. Like it's, it's, it's kind of comical. Bottom line, though, we're not going to get above an alcohol concentration of more than 4.5 to maybe 6%. You do see these microbrews that get these 9% uh, alcohol concentrations. But yeast respire anaerobically. They, they're going to 
become toxic. They're basically going to make their own environment toxic once they get to about 14, 15% alcohol. So anytime you see something that's, you know, 50% alcohol, really anything above 15 is going to be a distilled. Now, often we'll see folks say, oh, in 800 BC, you know, white people were distilling things. In Asia, they were distilling things in 1000 BC. They just weren't drinking it because they didn't have the enzyme to break down alcohol, didn't think it was something that you were supposed to drink. They were using it for perfumes and things like that. And given the showering habits of the ancient days, uh, perfumes were a very valuable product. But the bottom line is, we're not going to get anything above about 14% alcohol without distillation. And what's going on with distillation? Well, alcohol is going to boil off before water. It boils at a lower temperature, right? And if you've got what my grandma used to have, this circular copper tube or even a straight copper tube in a pot still, but uh, a way to cool it off on one end and let the, the mash, the combination of grains and, and yeast uh, in a big pot on the other, the alcohol is going to come off first. That first couple of ounces, I'll be candid, at least in Missouri, we throw that away because that's going to have a lot of methanol. We've got a subset of alcoholic molecules that aren't ethyl alcohol, but are related, and they may be intoxicating, but they also create formic acid and basically make you blind and eventually kill you and this was a big problem in Prohibition and unfortunately today still in, in Africa and places like that where folks are, are running a lot of backyard stills. It also was super cheap during Prohibition to get methanol to get what they used to call. Anyway, the bottom line is there, there was an industrial source of alcohol that was super cheap and then there was alcohol for human consumption. And a lot of folks, either out of ignorance or greed, ended up getting methyl alcohol spread around and folks did end up going blind and occasionally dying from it. It is toxic. If you're going to run your own still, by all means, throw away those first two ounces. Um, essentially, you can see methanol is going to burn yellow if you put it in a spoon and light it on fire. Alcohol is going to burn blue or barely visible. It's kind of an intriguing thing if you ever deglaze a pan or things like that. It's, it's, it's a wonderful... Can you tell I'm really into alcohol? This is hilarious. Okay. Bottom line, distilled spirits are going to be 40 to 50% alcohol. Well, what's this got to do with proof? Well, proof is basically double the percentage. So a uh, distilled spirit that is 100 proof is 50% alcohol. Or as my dad used to call it, the poor man's color television. So if you've got 100 proof vodka, that's 50% alcohol. Now I realize... You may not know whether to drink it or rub it on your back. And truth be told, given the health data, you should probably rub it on your back. But bottom line is proof is twice whatever the alcohol rate. Although nobody would say, hey, this beer is nine proof. When we do get into uh, the distilled spirits, especially whiskey, we end up uh, having folks claim at least up to 100 proof. You'll get these 101s. There's a 151 rum that's legendary, as you, as you know, as you imagine, that's 75.5% alcohol. Once you're getting that much alcohol into a beverage, obviously there's less room to have any flavor. So uh, Everclear, this 190 proof or 95% uh, alcohol product, it's not going to taste like anything but fire. So... Don't drive yourself nuts comparing these different ones. And the distillation process relies upon what I was saying. Taking a grain, letting it ferment with yeast until the sugars have been uh, essentially transformed into alcohol. Boiling that alcohol off, letting the methanol get thrown away, and then reboiling, refiltering. Uh, you'll see a lot of vodkas in particular that say triple distilled, right? That the chance for more and more of the impurities to get out is definitely there. They'll get it out at, you know, in a, in a special kind of still, basically at 190 proof, but then dilute it with water. And then the choice of water seems to contribute to flavor. 
in all honesty, if you're mixing it with orange juice anyway, it doesn't matter. There was a time in the United States where basically all vodkas came from one of four domestic places that were making it and just relabeling it and, and things like that. So, yeah, don't drive yourself nuts paying for fancy schmancy vodka. All right. I guess I was really excited about that slide because I listed it twice. All right. So again, we've got beers, we've got wine, we've got distilled spirits, and these are sort of the standard different ones. I do want you to know where each thing comes from. Yes, it is inherently interesting to me, but this is the kind of thing that'll help you win bets in bars. So brandy is, as I mentioned, uh, from grapes or cherries or other fruits. A subset of folks do get a wine and then turn it into a brandy by distilling the wine, but that's pretty complicated and often a poor use of a decent wine. So instead they just have whatever fruit they've got around. I, <laughs> I had friends in Missouri who made dandelion uh, brandy, basically. They would throw dandelions in there, get it all fermented, and then distill it off. Any kind of thing that the yeast will eat, as long as it's a carbohydrate that'll turn into sugar, is going to work just fine. Now, rum is definitely sugarcane or molasses. You can make rum at home. Again, I'm not recommending the home game, but you want unsulfured molasses, but a ton of it, a lot of water, and then there's special yeast just bred for rum now that are actually pretty cool. You're going to let that sit for a while while the yeast all eat that molasses and basically turn it from sugar into alcohol and carbon monoxide, and then you're going to distill that that's uh, not my favorite beverage, but definitely one that is certainly popular. So scotch, essentially you've got corn, uh, either you know maize basically, or barley put together. And ideally it's going to be malted. It's going to be toasted up a little bit. You're going to heat it up to turn some of those carbohydrates into sugars right away. And then the yeast are going to have a good time just jumping right on that. Um... Oh, in fact, George Washington's recipe for whiskey is uh, corn and wheat that's malted and uh, turned into, into whiskey. Bourbon is basically only corn, and then we get caught in these different grains and different whiskey. So like a rye whiskey is supposedly 51% rye, and what grain you use is going to be a contributor to, to how it goes, and then aging in a, in a barrel, particularly a a barrel that's had uh, the inside all burned out so that, that some of those flavors of the wood and some of that carbon is going to get in there. What a surprise. These are carcinogens, though. Let's, let's get real. But basically, folks from Scotland came over, didn't have barley running around, but had tons of corn and said, hey, let's, let's do what we do, only it's not obviously scotch because it's not made in Scotland. But uh, we'll, we'll, make, we'll make this and we'll call it bourbon. And then the distinction between the different whiskeys, people get in big fights about that. You don't need to know any of that for the test, and it's it's not fun at blood alcohol concentrations under 0.04. The key with gin is it's almost any grain, right? But you're going to distill it to the point where it's really strong, like literally a first run on gin, be over 100 proof, but it's flavored with juniper. If you take the juniper dried berries basically and put those in that uh my grandma used to call it the pig stick basically that circular round copper tube and then they're going to pick up the scent and the flavor of those dried juniper berries as they're distilling that's going to be a yummy gin i know there's like a cucumber one now and, and things like that and yeah i love getting in fights about which gin is best I do feel like this is one where people have different uh, beverage-specific expectancies. I watch my dad and stepmom fight every time they drink gin, so I thought gin makes you angry. Vodka is pure alcohol diluted with water. This literally can be made from anything, so I know the reputation is, oh, vodka is made from potatoes, and you can get a potato vodka. Usually uh, Eastern European countries make it. But in all honesty, whatever grain is the cheapest ends up getting turned into vodka 
because you're distilling it at, at such an amazing rate, you're not really going to taste anything else. Yes, there is a subset of folks who have special water and things like that, but in all honesty, again, if you're going to mix it with anything, I doubt you're going to be able to tell the difference. And then tequila, despite a lot of reputations, is really juice of the mod way. So is that worm cocaine? No, it is not. Is that worm even psychoactive? None of the ones that we've been able to get here in the United States. They do say, oh, and it's cocaine in there. We talked about coca ethylene when we did the cocaine lecture, but bottom line is tequila definitely makes you think crazy things like I'm the Mexican Jew, Shalom Amigo. But the bottom line is this is from a cactus and whatever fruit there is around for the yeast to eat is going to work. It's, uh, again, a, another distilled plant, and it's well-known in South America. So the definition of a standard drink has turned into quite a bit of intense argument, but we've sort of picked roughly equivalent amounts of alcohol across different types. Now, as you can imagine, we're having a hell of a time getting a standard in, in the cannabis world, but at least these all contain pretty much the same number of grams of alcohol. So if you're going to have a 5-ounce glass of wine, a 12-ounce can of beer, a 1.5-ounce shot of 80-proof liquor, um, I don't know if anybody drinks wine coolers anymore, but yeah, the 12 ounces of a wine cooler was also... Uh, a comparable amount. Now I want to emphasize that a hundred proof liquor is going to be another 20% higher uh, alcohol concentration. So that's worth assessing if you are going to get into it. And you know, the 16 pounders, the, the 16 ounce beers, it's one and another fourth, right? So if you're going to try to count how many drinks am I having in a week, that's definitely a key issue. Bottom line keep these as low as possible, the health outcomes are probably best. So the disparity of alcohol consumption, this slide is really apparently not helping people understand. The take-home message is far and away, most of the alcohol consumed is consumed by the top 10% of drinkers. So there's literally 10% of the U.S. is drinking 60% of the alcohol consumed. 30% of Americans are non-drinkers. And I realize in a college setting that seems comical, but, you know, you meet these people and I say, you know, when was the last time you had an alcoholic drink? And they say, let's see, champagne on New Year's. Oh, wait, that was 2018, right? Like... A lot of people just do not drink much. Um, and the correlates of that, what a surprise, they're Latinas. Now, the, generally, women drink less than men, and so, some cultures are more disparaging about alcohol use, particularly among women than others. Most folks don't drink all that much. And our perception of what is normative is contributing to how much we drink. So drinkers tend to think most people are drinkers and they're stunned to learn that 30% of the U.S. doesn't drink at all. Those crazy posters you see around campus that say, you know, 10% of you Albany undergrads don't wake up on a Sunday morning with a dick drawn on their head. Um, bottom line is getting the message across that most of your classmates don't drink all that much either. And so odds are high if you're drinking a lot, you're, you're alone in that. Okay, I've got a little court cartoon here where uh, two pregnant women have shirts that have arrows pointing to baby, and this little guy with a beer belly has a shirt that points to his belly, and it says beer. Take-home message is alcohol is uh, 7 calories per gram, so just a little less than fat, and really has no vitamins. And we'll get into some of these cardiac data and stuff, but there really is no health benefit of alcohol consumption that you couldn't get from taking a baby aspirin every day or, God forbid, not eating meat. All right, here's a little quiz question just in case. So if I said, what is a standard drink? We've got one ounce of liquor, 
12 ounces of beer or 10 ounces of wine. And as you know, it's the 12 ounce beer. One ounce of 100 proof liquor, once you figure out all the fractions, is not quite right. And 10 ounces of wine is actually two standard drinks, despite what some of my wine-loving friends might think. Why does this matter? Well, the physician's recommendations for a while were uh, 14 drinks a week for men, 7 drinks a week for women, but no more than 2 a day for men, and no more than 1 a day for women. And truth be told, it's really all about how much pressure are you putting on the liver, and what is that peak blood alcohol concentration. If you don't have a ton of tolerance, uh, a single drink consumed in an hour will get you up to about 0.02, and that's probably going to feel as good as alcohol can make you feel without a lot of the negative consequences, the hangover, and the acute withdrawal that we'll discuss later. And here we have what percent of U.S. citizens are abstainers, and this varies, you know, a little bit, but 30% is a reasonable guess. So the idea that a third of the U.S. doesn't actually drink alcohol very regularly is completely defensible based on the epidemiological data and, you know, something to keep in mind if uh, you're thinking about cutting down. So the definitions of binge drinking have driven me crazy for quite some time, and then my student Joe Labrie, who's at Loyola Marymount, has done some stellar work on it. I really... I tip my hat to him. So for years and years, they say, okay, it's going to be five drinks for a man or four drinks for a woman in a single evening. So this is already set up to be sexist and makes some tacit assumptions about lean body mass and about the uh, enzymatic differences that vary with sex. So ideally five drinks are more in a row for a man. This was going to get you up to a blood alcohol concentration of 0.10 was part of the rationale. Truth be told, if you've got a lot of food in your stomach and you drink these one per hour uh, across five hours, it really wouldn't be all that problematic as far as intoxication is concerned. The cancer data are still uh, being fought about. And then four drinks or more in a row for for women, the tacit assumption is they're going to be smaller, but also women seem to have about 10% less of one of the enzymes we're going to talk about when it gets to metabolism of alcohol. And so uh, they were thinking, hey, women are going to run into problems at a lower dose. Let's use this definition. In the early wine family, a binge is you were drunk three days in a row. Like this is not what binge means in normal drinking world. So, uh, you know, I don't need to tell you stories about my grandma's funeral, but that was what binge meant. Not one night where you had four drinks and you happened to be a woman. But trying to redefine this is part of the effort to get folks to drink less. And as you can imagine, I was really resistant and uh, big into the civil liberties of this, but the data are starting to scare me. And as we get more and more evidence for the links, particularly with cancer and long-term heavy alcohol consumption, that's pretty compelling. And then these alleged cardioprotective effects, particularly of red wine, just not panning out in the way that we would hope. And clearly there are better ways to get to the same mechanisms of lowering HDL, lowering uh, the high-density lipoprotein uh, cholesterol. So I've just got a do not disturb sign, blood alcohol experiment in progress, and it's got this guy lying underneath a keg. The binge drinking is a serious problem in college-aged folks. In part, I think in the U.S. in particular, you don't have a ton of experience drinking, so you don't know how it works. You haven't seen it modeled much if your parents didn't drink a little bit in front of you. And so if it was part of a religious ritual, that may have, have helped a little bit but you are suddenly free on your own. You're 18 years old. There's alcohol available, even if it's not legal. And you don't know what your limits are. You end up mixing without understanding how that works. And usually one good bout of uh, vomiting will help some folks learn, but some folks learn faster than others, shall we say. But the key is we'll have some recommendations down the line, but obviously you don't want to lie down underneath a keg. 
And yes, alcohol is toxic, and our best way of getting rid of toxins up front is, of course, to throw them up. I do have this scary image of this poor cat who uh, ended up intoxicated as well. Pretty much, certainly all the primates and uh, all the mammals are going to respond to alcohol in comparable ways. We do have data on this, and it does seem to suggest a, a rabbit, for example, when it gets drunk, the little ear will fall forward. We've got behavioral measures of this for the animal research. Uh, the whole idea kind of creeps me out. I am going to save this now just because I'm not sure how big the files are going to get. And I will do an alcohol too and, and enter that up on YouTube as well. Stay strong. Thanks so much.